All right, thank you. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to uh, present my work. So I'm going to talk about well, this is, uh, I'm going to mainly explain my work with Kevin Costilla, which appeared in, in August last year. But uh, it's also based on a series of work papers I, I written with various people, uh, not, not many various people. But, uh, yeah. So then, uh, as the title explains, I will talk about three things. String theory, gauge theory, integrable systems. So as you know, integrable systems is a big subject in mathematical physics. And you also have gauge theory. It's, it's another big area of research. And there's a, a huge overlapping region here. And finally, uh, we have string theory, which, is, which we don't know much about. But it certainly intersects with the other two areas. So my talk lies in this intersection. OK, so uh, and, the, uh, and especially I will talk about um, quantum integrable systems. Uh, there are two famous quantum integrable systems which turn out to be equivalent. One is the XYZ spin chain, which is a one dimensional quantum mechanical system with spins uh, either taking up or down and they align on a line, and they interact with uh, nearest neighbors. Okay? And, or equivalently, I will talk about the 8th vertex model, which is a two-dimensional lattice model. So here I have drawn lattice uh, on, on a torus. And you have spins uh, located on the edges of the lattice. Okay? And they interact uh, with uh, neighbors around, the, around vertices. So uh, it's been observed that these uh, two famous quantum integrable systems arise from various quantum field theories. So I listed five of these, five, of, five examples of such appearances. But I will probably uh, don't have time to explain all of them. So I will focus mostly on, on these highlighted ones. So the first one is 2D, from 2D, 3D, 4D gauge theories with four supersymmetries. So that's something uh, people often call 2D necros of Shashvili correspondence uh, by referring to the 2D case, but it also has an analog in 3D and 4D. Okay? And the second instance in which these integral systems appear uh, from quantum field theories, 4D, 5D, 6D gauge theories with eight supersymmetries. So that's something people uh, may call 4D version of necros of Shashvili. Okay? And we also have uh, in, in more recently, uh, people have ob observed that uh, from 3D gauge theories with eight supersymmetries, uh, well, structures of, uh, of spin chains appear by, uh, by these people, uh, uh, Baltimore Dimov de Cayota and uh, 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 Braverman Finkelberg, uh, Count uh, Caldera Nakajima Webster Weeks, so, which is, so it takes uh, one line to uh, write the names. Also, uh, we also have more, uh, a little bit more complicated 4D theories with uh, n equals 1 supersymmetry for supercharges, and in which uh, such structures of integral systems have been uh, found. And finally, I will, and this is the main character of my talk, I will talk about 4D version of Transheim's theory, which was uh, constructed by Costello some time ago, five years ago, and which was also the subject of studies uh, study by Costello, Witten, and Yamazaki. And also, uh, that's the main um, theory we, I analyzed in my paper with Kevin. Okay, so, um, so the question is, given these, all these five instances in which the same spin chains or, uh, or the uh, uh, lattice model appears, the question is the following. So why does a single quantum integral system, so remember those two integral systems are really equivalent, so there's a single quantum integral system appearing from multiple quantum field theory setups. So this is a big question we'd like, we wanted to understand. And all right, so uh, this is a physics talk, so I'm sorry about that. So I'm going to confuse uh, many people. But uh, uh, so we found a physics answer. So the physics answer is that, well, these appearances are, well, these quantum field theory setups are actually different descriptions of the same, one and same physical system related by dualities in string theory. So once you embed those quantum field theories into string theory, and you can use 
string dualities and you can relate one another. Okay? So there's only one system we are talking about, really. So that's why the same quantum integral system appears. Okay, so, um, so this is the question, this is the answer, this is the main message I'd like to convey uh, in today's talk. So here's the uh, outline of my talk. So I just explained the motivation for our work. And then I will, next I will explain how integral lattice models. So in, uh, for example, the eight vertex model I, I, I talked about arises from something I call partially topological quantum field theories. And then I will explain how string theory realizes such a structure of partially topological string, uh, quantum field theory. And then uh, I will apply, start applying string dualities to such string theory real realization, which give rise to various string theory setups, which can be interpreted as various quantum field theory setups, which are the, are the, the, uh, the, the items in the list I, I showed you. Okay, and then finally I will summarize and uh, give an outlook. Okay, so, so that's the, uh, the plan of the talk. So, so far, so good. So if there's no question, I'll explain how integral lattice models appears from partially topological quantum field theories, okay? So uh, consider, well, uh, first, consider a two-dimensional TQFT and suppose it has line operators, L alpha. So alpha is just an index distinguishing different line operators. So I put the theory on a torus. So here's my torus and take a number of line operators and wrap them around various one cycles of the torus and make a, uh, make a lattice. Okay, so here I have five line operators making a, a two by three lattice. Okay, they, they have, uh, the problem we are interested in is to compute the correlator, correlation function of this configuration of line operators in this theory. So how do we do that? Okay. So one way of doing this is to divide the, uh, the torus into square pieces. Okay. Uh, well, it doesn't show uh, really. So here's actually, uh, there's a square. All right, so uh, each piece, each square piece looks like this. So you have a little square and two intersecting segments of line operator operators. Here I have L alpha, L beta intersecting in the middle. All right, and because of the topological invariance of the theory, well, it doesn't matter how exactly uh, the shapes of these squares are, okay? Only the topology matters. So now, the idea is to uh, compute uh, the path integral force on, on each piece and then glue the results together, okay? So now, in order to compute the, well, the path integral on, on this piece, first of all, we have four corners and we have to specify boundary conditions on the corners, so which I label A, B, and C, and D. Okay, so for the purpose of visualizing, well, for, for the ease of uh, uh, visualization, let's uh, deform this picture slightly into this picture, okay? It's uh, by this picture, I really mean this one. Okay? But here, the corner, uh, it's, cut, it's cut out into an uh, uh, arc-like shape, okay? But I distinguish the corner from the sides by uh, drawing the corner with double lines. Okay. So uh, I have this picture. But if you look at this picture, it just looks like two open strings coming from left and bottom, and they scatter they off to uh, top and right, okay? It just looks like that. And moreover, each open string, so for example, you have an open string here, propagating to the right. All right, so it carries actually a particle in the middle, say particle of type alpha. And this particle sweeps out, the world line of this particle is this line. Okay, so uh, world line of particle uh, is, the, is the line operator. Okay, and Furthermore, uh, well, we have open strings and which end on brains. Okay, open strings, that's the end on brains. And brains are labeled by these A, B, and C, D, these labels. Okay, so we have this picture. So uh, technically, I, I think what uh, we're doing is we're dealing with uh, two-dimensional open-closed topological quantum field theory with line defects. 
So now, well, let's do a path integral on this picture. What do we get? So, well, let's say, well, we have four boundaries, I mean, uh, four open strings, two initial open strings and two final open strings. And let's say, well, Hubert spaces of these uh, strings are like V, A, B, alpha for, for this one. Okay, so it's, an, it's a, the space of states of an open string with uh, brains A and B with particle alpha attached in the middle. Okay, so we have four of these. If you do the path integral on this piece, what you get is a scattering amplitude. So which is a linear operator, which I call the R matrix, R alpha beta ABCD, which is a linear map from uh, the initial state space, that's V alpha, B, uh, V A B comma alpha tensor V B C beta into final states. So that's this times that. Is clear. So, what do you mean by part integral of this picture? This partition function. Yeah, partition function. Z applied to this. Right. So, and so, but in any case, this is just a, a, a matrix. And so, you can talk about matrix elements once you specify states in, in these spaces, which I denote by ij and kl inside circled. Okay. So, so by this picture, I mean this matrix, particular matrix element. So this is the result of the path integral on, on, on this picture, on, on a single piece. Now what we have to do is, to re what we want to reconstruct the whole torus. What we have to do is we take, uh, we glue these pieces back together. So single piece looks like that. If you collect all these pieces and glue them back together, we get this picture, okay? So now, uh, to glue them together, what we have to do is the following. So first of all, we want to pick uh, boundary conditions on the corners, so which means I, we choose brains, a, well, A, B, C, D, and those uh, labels on each double line circles. And then second, I will, and then I will also choose states of open strings in each single line circles, okay? And then I get a bunch of uh, matrix elements of the R matrix. What I do is I take the product of all R matrix elements, and then I finally sum over all possible configurations of boundary conditions or brains, and also over all, all possible configurations of states. Is this clear? Yeah, this is just a glowing of, of, of TQFT, right? So, but if you look at this uh, procedure, this is nothing but the definition of the uh, partition function of a lattice model in statistical mechanics, all right, in which so, uh, spin sites, so spins are located on, on these single lined and double lined circles, and spin variables are labels um, of, of states or brains over which we, uh, 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 which we sum over later. And the Boltzmann weight, so that's the e to the minus kb energy, is just the R matrix element. Yeah. But there's something strange, a, a point of intersection of two solid lines, also type of particles can change, stay, you know, type of strings can uh, change. And they'll feel all... Yeah, I'm assuming such things doesn't... Ah, yeah, so it's ah, yeah. slightly asymmetric, there's some vertices which you don't... Yeah, right. That's true. So I'm assuming uh, there's n nothing like that going on. So for the purpose of this talk, that, that'll become uh, clear uh, uh, in the next slide, I think, why I, I, I'm assuming that. But anyway, so uh, this is just the uh, partition function of a uh, uh, lattice model. So uh, in conclusion, I, I can say that if you have a two-dimensional topological quantum field theory, put it on a torus, wrap, them, uh, wrap line operators, and make a lattice, and compute a uh, correlation function, then that's equal to the partition function of a lattice model, two-dimensional lattice model in statistical mechanics. Okay, so this just this just follows from the structure of topological quantum field theory with line operators. All right. Um, now, uh, so what's going to be really interesting is when uh, there's a really a hidden extra dimension in, in in the theory. So suppose the theory is not really two dimensional, but really a higher dimensional theory on a torus times some additional space C. 
So what I'm doing is I take a higher dimension theory, I compactify that <laughs> on, on, on this extra dimension C, I get a, a two-dimensional theory, and I'm assuming that's topological homomorphism theory. Okay? And now, uh, suppose it's, it's the case, then, and suppose this higher dimension theory has, uh, uh, has line operators, which descend to the line operators I was uh, talking about. Then uh, two things happen. Uh, uh, well, this implies two things. The first, uh, each line operator carries a continuous parameter, which I call the spectral parameter of the line, U alpha, which is nothing but the location of that line in, in, in C. Okay, so it gives you a naturally a, a, a continuous parameter. Second, I can define something called the transform matrix uh, by this picture. So this is a uh, alpha horizontal line making a loop in the horizontal direction and intersected by uh, segments of vertical lines. Okay, so this picture defines an endomorphism in the uh, of the state well uh, of the states uh, well, space of states on a circle intersected by these line operators. Okay, so it gives so initial state. I have some state here. After the, uh, well, the action of the transform matrix gives you another state which lives here. Okay, so if you define transform matrices by, by, uh, by this picture, and then uh, to take two such transform matrices, and then they commute, they have, they have to commute um, uh, if the theory really is a higher dimension. The reason being, because we have a two-dimensional topological invariance in the, in the, uh, on the torus, which is, say, well, torus is this screen, say, right? So by using that topological invariance, I can move uh, each line operator, horizontal line operator, up and down. And I try, say, I take uh, the bottom line, op horizontal line, and move it up and try to uh, pass it over to the top and try to get this picture. Naively, if you only have two-dimensional topological quantum field theory, that does, well, it doesn't allow you to do that because topology changes. But because we really have a higher, well, uh, extra dimension C, so suppose that's a direction uh, perpendicular to the screen. So, and, and generically, these horizontal lines are located at different positions in, in this extra dimension. So when you try to go from this picture to this, that picture, there's nothing singular going on. Okay, they miss each other in the extra dimensions. So, uh, and so this equality holds. All right. So, uh, so the uh, existence of extra dimension C implies these two things, which in turn implies uh, the lattice model we obtain is integrable, because these two things imply that there is a series of commuting conserved charges which I obtain by simply expanding the transform matrix in, in the spectral parameter. Okay. So the lattice model is what well, we, we obtain from uh, this topological quantum, 2D topological quantum field theory with extra dimension C. It's not just random lattice model, but it's an integral lattice model. And by the same reasoning, you can also uh, show, easily show that the R matrix I defined uh, satisfies the young box equation. Yes? But do you mean that the R matrix has a spectral dependence and it's a spectral, uh, you know, young box equation with a spectral parameter? Or right. do you mean the, 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 not, the constant R matrix? No, no. It depends, on, it depends on spectral parameters, assuming that the higher dimensional theory is not topological on C. Right. So there's a, so, all right, so this theory is topological on T2, but not on C so that I get a non-trivial dependence on the spectral parameter. So how do you recover the, you started with a constant R matrix. In the, in the previous discussion, you had a constant R matrix. No, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't assume anything there. I, I was assuming, that, well, I, I was assuming that you can just uh, define this R matrix and then. Uh, you know, oh, so this you know, so the so parameter, yeah. Right, so you, yes, so you can include in this alpha or beta, these labels, the spectral parameter if you want. Uh, I see, and you never asserted that it satisfied the infection. Well, uh, no, no, not here, not here. All right, so, um, so uh, 
this is the conclusion. Correlation function of lattice of line operators in a topological, 2D topological homomorphy theory with extra dimension C, in which the theory depends non-topologically, is equal to the partition function of an integrable lattice model. Okay? So uh, this is a beautiful observation by Kevin, uh, which I extended slightly in, in my paper. So, yeah, so this um, really explains where the uh, spectral parameters in, in integrable lattice models come from geometrically. <coughs> so it's, it's very nice. All right, so, in, so uh, are there any questions so far? So this is just some abstract argument, which I'd like to make concrete using string theory. Okay? Yes? From your discussion, you assume that you alpha and you beta were different. Yeah, I mean, when, yeah, when spectral parameters uh, can take certain value, the R matrix can diverge. So I'm assuming that the situation is generic so to avoid such uh, divergence. Right. So, uh, so uh, I'd like to explain that there's a string theory setup which realizes this two-dimensional topological homomorphy theory with extra dimensions naturally. Okay. So and so I'm going to uh, I'm dive into string theory and using brains and that kind of stuff. So, all right, so uh, pre be prepared. So consider a, a type 2B string theory and take a stack of N D5 brains, which looks like that, and <coughs> put them on a full manifold M times C, which lies in, which is, so M is uh, actually zero section of T star M and C is C. So, the 10 dimensional space time is T star M times C. All right? And uh, it, it turns out that for some fraction of supersymmetry is to be preserved, this C, well, which is, which is a, a, a complex curve, has to be flat. So the only uh, po well, possible choices are whether C is a complex plane or a cylinder or an elliptic curve. We have these three cases. But in any case, uh, we, we know that on D5 brains, if we have n of them, we, um, we, on, on the D5 brains, we get six-dimensional maximally supersymmetric amulet theory with gauge symmetry un, or if you decouple, well, you, if you throw away the decoupled u1 center of mass u1, uh, we get g, well, gauge group su n. All right? And it turns out that, well, because of this particular background geometry, this six-dimensional theory turns out to be topologically twisted along M. All right? And it turns out that if you analyze what this topological twist does, well, uh, you see that it makes the theory topological on M for manifold M, but holomorphic on C. So here I get a six-dimensional topological holomorphic theory on M times C. All right, so this is, uh, well, and in order to connect this six-dimensional topological holomorphic theory, we have to get somehow two-dimensional topological holomorphic theory, right? Because I was talking about two-dimensional topological theory with extra dimensions, which uh, we can take to be C, all right? So in order to get such two well, two D topological quantum theory with extra di holomorphic direction C, what I do, uh, what, what what I do is something called the omega deformation, all right? So uh, so up to now, M was uh, some full manifold, but let's specialize to the case where uh, M is R2 times torus, all right? And there is a background field in string theory called Ramon-Ramon forms, and especially there's Ramon-Ramon two form, and we give it a, a particular background value, which, um, which I'm not going to uh, explain in detail, but, but uh, I will do that. Then this actually introduces something called the omega deformation to the six dimensional theory. And this breaks the topological invariance on the four manifold M down to topological invariance on, on just this part, T2. And therefore we get a topological homomorphic theory on T2 times C, which is perfect 
because that's exactly the kind of structure we were looking for. Okay. So now wh what's missing is, is line operators. We have to insert line operators in, in this uh, topological holomorphic theory on, on T2 times C, right? which we can do using open strings. So, um, uh, so suppose you have a semi-infinite open string ending on the stack of D5 brains. The endpoint inside the D5 wall volume theory acts like a, a, a charged particle, infinitely heavy charged particle. And as the open string moves, well, its wall line of the endpoint gives a yeah, creates a Wilson line in the six dimension theory. Okay? Which is um, which actually sits at the origin of R2 in, in R2 times torus. So um, so Wilson line in the six dimensional space-time lives at the origin of R2, but some uh, one cycle K in curve K in, in the torus, and it also sits at some point on, on this holomorphic curve C. So we can create a whistle line like this. So well, and this whistle line actually carries the uh, is in the vector representation representation of the gauge group because there are n choices of d five brains for the uh, for each open string to end on end. So uh, that corresponds to the vector representation. All right. So because now we have two D topological phi theory, quantum phi theory with extra holomorphic direction C with line operators, and so we can do uh, what I explained before and get an integrable lattice model. All right, so that's what we did in our paper. So uh, what integrable lattice model? Question. Yes. Can you go back? So this Wilson yeah. line operator, it's supported on a closed contour or open? Uh, uh, it's, let's assume it's closed. Because yeah, it's it's in a torus, and it makes uh, it's a closed curve in, in the torus. It's a closed curve, so there is a string which comes in and open and ends on a closed curve. Yeah. So the current. Okay. Right. So uh, let me see. So first of all, we have to identify. So we have to do do two things. We have to identify what kind of of topological homomorphic theory in 4D on T two times C we get by this procedure, and what kind of lattice model. Uh, we get from that theory with Wilson lines. All right, so uh, omega deformation uh, actually simplifies uh, some theory to a theory in dimension lower by two. So it's, uh, it's uh, uh, some technical fact we, which, which has been known for quite some time. So because we are applying this omega deformation to six dimensional theory on R2 times T2 times C, the deformation reduces the 6D theory to a 4D theory on T2 times C. And this 4D theory turns out to be this 4D Chun theory of Costello. All right, and- Your construction C could be the elliptic curve? Yes. So that theory was introduced in my PhD thesis in 1996. And right. It was shown to be anomalous. Uh-huh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Uh, okay, so, yeah. Must accommodate anomaly. Uh-huh. Okay, I, I didn't know that. And what forces your open string to follow this loop K? Open strings don't, don't do what you like. What do you mean? How do you force the, the, the line operator to be along the curves which you want? Oh, I can't do that? I mean, what we normally mean by, let's mm -hmm. say, D5 brain, and the, that's the uh, Neumann conditions along uh, along the directions of D5 and world volume and mm -hmm. uh, Dirichlet in the transversal, so the open string it goes everywhere along D5 and sits in the position of the D5 at the transversal direction, but it's not fixed on a specific contour. Okay, so uh, probably you can explain that uh, in detail later, right? So, but anyway, so uh, we get a, a Fortitian sign theory, which is a uh, whose action is like this. So we have 1 over h bar, time, and Lagrangian is very strange. DZ wedge turns out straight form. All right, so, so this DZ, so Z is the uh, holomorphic complex coordinate on C, okay? And 
uh, and this h bar is a Planck constant, which is proportional to the omega deformation parameter, which I call epsilon. And we can calculate the R matrix uh, in perturbation theory in h bar. All right. So you can just do that. And we have three cases. Uh, so the first two cases, we have a C equals complex plane or a cylinder. We, in, in those cases, we get rational six vertex model or trigonometric six vertex model, and which uh, are equivalent to XXX and XY, XX spin chains. So if you take the, if you look at the uh, conserved charges of these <laughs> models, they include Hamiltonians for these spin chains. And for the elliptic case, we get uh, not XYZ spin chain, as uh, one may naively expect. What you get is something called Felder's elliptic dynamical R matrix, which carries an extra parameter lambda, which is in, is in the dual of the Cartan of the uh, gauge algebra. And these, well, this extra parameter is associated with the degrees of freedom living on faces of the lattice. But that parameter is absent for these cases. All right, and, but this uh, elliptic dynamical R matrix is related to the uh, more well-known Baxter's elliptic R matrix for eight vertex model by just conjugation by, by some operator. And this vertex, eight vertex model is uh, equivalent to the XYZ spin chain. Okay. So uh, that's what you get. So now, uh, let me, yep. So what you, what, is there any physical reason for restricting yourself to the curve? C so, or because, or right, because... Any human surface might work? No, uh, it doesn't. One for, for convention conform, yeah. Yes, that's, that's, one, that's one reason. But the, uh, more fundamentally, uh, because we, have, we started with six-dimensional theory on a four-manifold m times c, and I, the string theory set up construction only logically twist the theory along the m direction, for manifold direction, and it doesn't do that to, to the directions of c. Okay? So m can be any, any four manifold, c, but c has to be flat in order for s some supersymmetries to be preserved. So c, uh, c, c has to be flat. And that restricts the choices of, the, of, of c. Okay. Um, so, uh, because we have uh, embedded everything into string theory, now you can apply string dualities. All right, so uh, first chain of dualities, uh, well, there are infinitely many chains of dualities you can think of, but one interesting chain of dualities you can apply to this setup is uh, S duality and then T duality in the direction, horizontal direction of torus. All right, so I start with D5 brains with uh, fundamental strings ending, uh, well, going in the hor either horizontal or vertical directions in the lattice, and then the uh, Raman Raman to form field. Okay, now I apply S duality, which turns D5 brains in into NS5 brains, F1's fundamental strings into D1 brains, and C2 into B field B. And then I apply T duality. NS5 remains as NS5 actually, because it wraps around the direction uh, to which I apply T duality. And D1's uh, going in the horizontal direction of the torus now becomes D0 brain. D1, vertical D1's become D2 brains. And uh, B field remains as B field. But anyway, anyway, so that's what I get. So suppose for simplicity, let's uh, take big N to be two, so I only have two NS5 brains, which are these, and then I have D0 and D2 brains. I have D2 brains coming from uh, somewhere ending on either of the NS5 brains like that. And let's say, well, the number of uh, D2 brains ending on NS5, the second NS5 brains is big M, okay? The total number of D2 brains is small M. And I also have D0 brain coming from orthogonal direction and ending on one of the D5 brain, NS5 brains. All right, so this big M is something called the magnum number of, of the spin chain, which just counts the number of up spins 
in the spin chain. So, all right, so NS5-2 corresponds to spin up, NS5-1 corresponds to spin down. So I get this picture af after applying dualities. Right, now uh, let's forget about these zeros first. Okay, and then I, I, I get, I have this picture. And let's take, consider the, the rational case. And let's turn off uh, the V field for simplicity. Then this picture, this NS5D2 brain system is a very well-known one. It realizes two-dimensional N equals 4,4 gauge theory with UM gauge group with N matter fields. So UM gauge group comes from this part of D2 brains. I have M of them. And N hypermultiplex, N matter fields comes from uh, this region of D2 brains. All right. So I get th this theory, which is described by this quiver. And now uh, uh, Z alphas are locations of D2 brains in the, uh, in the vertical direction. Vertical direction is the Z direction. Okay, so they are parameters uh, determining, which determine twisted masses, mass, mass parameters for uh, these matter fields. Okay, and now if you turn on B field, what it does is that it gives additional masses to various fields, and that breaks n equals four comma four supersymmetry down to two comma two. So it breaks half of the yeah, of supersymmetries. All right, um, and uh, let me mention that generally, if you look at this picture, the theory you see that theory is in the Higgs phase because NS five brains are in generically located at different x a uh, coordinates. All right, so if you know. Uh, what I'm talking about, then you see that's the case. And for uh, the alpha all equal and when there is no B field, it's known that in the fixed fa phase, this theory flows to a topological A model in topological A model whose target space is the cotangent bundle of the Grassmannian M comma N. Okay, and if you have more NS5 brains, then what the target space becomes just cotangent bundle of part, various partial flux manifolds. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's what NS5 brains and D2 brains create. Okay. Now I insert D0 brain. So remember D0 brain, um, sorry, so D0 brain, what it does is actually it creates a local operator in this A model. Okay, so and because D0 brain has a, a, a continuous parameter, this parameter Z, its location, and you can expand this local oper operator in, in, in this Z parameter, and you get a bunch of uh, local operators which generate the Carter ring, the uh, algebra of local operators of the A model, which is the quantum cohomology ring of the, of the tolerate space. Okay. Now, but for generic values of Z alphas and the B field, uh, this ring is replaced by the equivariant version. On the other hand, if you remember where the D0 came from, it came from a, a horizontal reason line in the horizontal direction of the lattice model. All right? So D0, well, inserting a D0 brain represents the uh, action of a transform matrix like this. So if you insert the D0 brain, it inserts in the lattice model a horizontal line, which is transform matrix. Therefore, uh, from these two pictures, you conclude that the, uh, the uh, equivalent quantum, quantum cohomology of the uh, T star GR Grassmannian M comma N is really the algebra of conserved charges in the XXX spin chain of length N, but you specify the, the Magna number, big M. Okay. What does the notation mean? This so this comes from uh, GL uh, and uh, flavor symmetry acting on. Uh, so this comes from GLN, and this comes from additional U uh, uh, U1, uh, which comes from the omega deformation parameter. The notation is slightly misleading. Small n is large, and uh, big M is small. Uh huh. Well, uh, I, I used the, all right, so I used, I wanted to use big M because that looks like the standard notation for magna number. But these are not giant magnets. <laughs> okay. No, it's a technical. 
Yeah, well, I agree. It's uh, it's a little awkward. But anyway, so this is just a statement of 2D necklace of stress really corresponds for this particular theory. Okay. So brain and what's nice is that brain construction provides a concrete realization of the the transfer matrix, this T operator, which is now, as far as I understand, well, I'm aware, uh, this has not been understood geometrically very well. But from well, using this picture, we can try to understand this T operator in terms of the quantum geometry of the target space. Okay. That can be nice. So now, um, so um, is there any question on this plot? Okay, so now what you can do is something more. So instead of D2s, well, we can try to, well, we can replace D2s by D4 brains to get this kind of picture. So we have K D4 brains here, and each D4 brain comes from left and on one of the NS5 brains, and then there is a slight displacement in the Z direction, and then they go off to infinity to the right. Okay, so you can consider this kind of brain picture. So then this brain picture, D4 and NS5 brains of uh, part of this picture realizes instead of 2D theory, 4D theory. So what we get from this picture is a 4D n equals 2 supersymmetric gauge theory, which is described by this linear quiver. Okay, so that's what we get if I use D4 brains instead of D2 brains. So now, uh, in the, so if you remember how I applied GLDs, I applied SGLD, TGLDs, uh, TGLD, and then uh, before. So we can do the reverse GLD transformations. Then you'll see that these D4 brains in the original brain setup are D3 brains. And so picture looks like that. So this is the torus of the, of the lattice, okay, and which is just a stack of ND5 brains, actually. And D3 comes from, from transverse direction and hits NS5 brain, so which, which is this part. D3 coming from, the, uh, from this direction hits the uh, uh, D5 brains. And then there's some region in which D3 and D5s uh, make a, a form of bound state. And then D3 brain leaves the D5s and moves on into the, into the board. So I get these strips of colored regions in, in, the, uh, in the D5 brain theory. Or in 4D transform theory, these are strips of self operators. Okay? So, uh, so we, have, uh, strips, we have strips of self operators in the vertical direction of the lattice model. But we can think of these, each strip as just a thick line operator. And you can identify what kind of repre representation uh, these, line o these thick line operators carry. Then you, you actually find that they are Varma modules of SLN. Okay. And in any case, that's what we get for the vertical lines. Now I insert the zero brain, which creates a, a horizontal line operator. Okay. So I get a, the corresponding transfer matrix by doing that. And this produces a transfer matrix of something called non-compact XXX spin chain. By non-compact, I mean vertical lines or in, uh, carry infinite dimensional representations. So I get a spin chain whose spins take values in infinite dimensional representations. And this is indeed what people have observed in, in this particular linear quiver theory. Uh, people have observed that the structure of non-compact spin chains appear. So now, uh, we can talk about, up to now, I have talked only about closed spin chains. But what about open spin chains? So we can also do that. All right, so uh, if you remember, I in order to arrive at this kind of brain setup, I applied at some point TGLD in the horizontal direction. So, so that's, but if, the, uh, that if that direction is not periodic, so in order to get an open spin, open spin chain, then I can no longer apply TGLD in that direction. But I can still apply SGLD 
which preceded the teleology. If I just do that without, uh, without applying the teleology, what, what I end up with is this setup. Okay, instead of d4s, I get d3s. Instead of d0, I, I have d1. Okay, but if you look at the d3 and then s5 part of this system, instead of 4D theories, it realizes 3D theory. And it's a, so this D3 and S5 part of the uh, setup realizes 3D n equals 4 supersymmetric linear quiver theory, which is a dimensional reduction of the 4D linear quiver theory I just explained. All right, so, and indeed, so the uh, prediction from this brain picture is that the structure of an open XXX spin chain should appear in this 3D n equals 4 linear quiver theory. And open spin chain has a, a, a much larger symmetry, underlying symmetry than the closed spin chain. And the, so in this case, what I get is the Youngian. And indeed, uh, it's been observed that Youngian appears from this particular theory. Okay. So uh, open, spin open spin chains can be understood from this, the same point of view. All right, so you can do uh, something more for example, if you take C to be the elliptic curve, and then you can apply T duality along uh, the both directions of the, uh, of the torus elliptic curve, then D1, D3, NS5 brain system I me just mentioned becomes D3, D5, NS5 brain system. And uh, D5 and NS5 make uh, bound states, make bound states like that. So you can consider this kind of setup and what, I, what you get by doing that is something called uh, uh, brain tiling, okay? And, it's, and it creates, it realizes a particular, uh, it's some four-dimensional supersymmetry gauge theory on R2 times the elliptic curve. And then D1 becomes D3. D3s create SAFs operators in this 4D theory on R2 times E. But anyway, so if you have 40 theory and compute the partition function on this geometry, what you get is something called a, a supersymmetric index. And I'm computing how, well, and you can uh, study how an insertion of a SAFS operator affects the supersymmetric index of this theory. And indeed, you find that a structure of, of an integrable system appears from SAFS oper operators in this theory. Like by looking at supersymmetric index. What is the notation? Uh, notation here, you mean? Yeah. Uh, it's a, or so, so you have two uh, directions in E. As you go around either direction, R2 is rotated by either by the real part or imaginary part of the epsilon. So it's a twisted product between R2 and the E. Twisted e. product, it's not, not, a, not a product, it's a type of bundle. Yeah. Okay, hyper product, maybe. Fiber. That's what I mean by, that's what I mean, yeah, some non-trivial fibration. That's what I mean by twisted product. All right, so uh, let me uh, just summarize uh, what I have done. So I explained how integrable lattice models can be constructed from line operators in partially topological quantum field theory in two plus n di dimensions in which, so this two, so, the theory is topological in two directions, but non-topological in the additional n directions. Okay, and I, uh, uh, I I told you that such a structure naturally actually arises from string theory. Okay, and then once you realize such a structure in string theory, you can apply dualities in string theory, which allow us to co connect it to various other quantum field theory setups in which integrability has been found. Okay. Now, uh, so what can we, where can we go from here? So, all right, so if you have, because you can consider well, infinitely many uh, different combinations of dualities in string theory, all right? And the prediction is for each chain of duality, you can extract some quantum field theory setup in which you should be able to find similar integrable system structure. Right, so you, you should be able to find something like Nekrasov's Shashvili correspondence for infinitely many different duality frames. 
So you can do a lot. Y you can have a lot of fun here. <coughs> right now, I, well, in this talk, I explained how the transform matrix T operators arise from Wilson lines in 4D transform theory. It turns out that the, uh, if you use tough lines instead of Wilson lines, then what it creates is something called Q operators, which are also um, important operators in, in uh, spin chains and lattice models. So this is work in progress with Kevin and David Gaiotto. Okay. And there's some relation to something called Carl Algebra's 40 theories, uh, because just because we, in this lattice model, we have holomorphic directions. Okay, and you can consider the uh, algebra of line operators. Then, if you just if you look at the whole, well, they they uh, make a curl algebra because we have a holomorphic dependence in that direction. That's also a work in progress with G uh, Huang O. Now, uh, at the end of the uh, uh, in, in the last part of my talk, I briefly mentioned the name brain tilings. And there I, I said that I was computing uh, certain supersymmetric index in the presence of subs operators and I find structure of integrable systems. But there are actually many different versions of supersymmetric indices you can compute in that theory. And, uh, and for each version, the, the same story uh, can be applied. And by doing that, you can expect to get new solutions of the young box equation by just changing the geometry on which you compute the, the index. Okay, so that's, all, uh, that's work in progress with uh, Kevin and Masahito Yamazaki. And finally, uh, the big question uh, people may want to ask is that, well, all right, so XX, X spin chains appeared in the context of ADS CFT corresponds. And so it's a vast subject which uh, may or may not be connected to this, but if it is, it would be wonderful. Okay. So I, I guess that's all I wanted to say today. Thank you. Any questions for Gina? Well, your constructions were limited to the A series, right? right? Yes. So to understand something about the ACFT, you need to extend this to at least superstition. Uh, which you have paper on, and uh, I, uh, we believe there's uh, uh, some related, some version of this construction can produce sup uh, super case, but we haven't uh, worked that out yet. Thank you, Ken. Um, well, I don't know, does it give you a new way to study the spectrum of species? Oh, relation uh, I mean, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, I, I don't feel I'm entitled to uh, make a definite answer here. If there's no further questions, let's thank Junior again.